Where do hobbits come from? Where did the writer Tolkien find these small, mysterious people, the heroes of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit? After working for 15 years on the films of Peter Jackson, adapted from the novels of Tolkien, illustrator John Howe went looking for an answer to these questions. Today, John's search nears its end, but having explored the European legends that inspired Tolkien, he has found no trace of The Hobbit. However, during his last trip, the figure of the dragon loomed large. Was his quest nearing its conclusion? As John's associate medievalist Leo Carruthers remarked, it's time to face the dragon. The dragon is a recurrent theme in ancient legends. Today, in the Eagle and Child, a pub frequented by Tolkien and his friends, members of the Tolkien Society are meeting for a session of reading dedicated to the dragon. Hey guys. Hello. This is my contribution. I'm oh, the King, one fellowship. Good. Truly. Oh, not another one. Uh, so, where are we at? Um, we found this good bit about dragons in on fairy stories. We'll go on, we, we all like dragons, and this makes it particularly clear <laughs> how much Tolkien likes dragons. I desired dragons with a profound desire. Of course, I, in my timid body, did not wish to have them in the neighbourhood, intruding into my relatively safe world, in which it was, for instance, possible to read stories in peace of mind, free from fear. But the world that contained even the imagination of Fafnir was richer and more beautiful, at whatever cost of peril. For an illustrator, what could be better than a dragon? They are so beautiful, the possibilities are endless. They fly, they're as big as an airliner, they breathe fire, they have teeth, scales, wings. They're extraordinary. So dragons are a tremendous challenge, both visually and content-wise. It's often the case that when I find something visually arresting, from a cultural, historical and mythological point of view, it turns out to be an exciting subject. So you sketch out a few lines, add a little color, knowing that behind it all, there are a thousand stories to be told. And for me, the dragon encapsulates that above anything else. A nice dragon. This plunges us into the world of fabulous creatures, trolls and monsters. All the ancient creatures that come to us through legends. Tolkien wrote an essay on fairy tales in which he said, it was in fairy tales that I sensed for the first time the power of words and the wonder of things. I think that word, wonder, is important. That enchantment that is the true sense of magic for Tolkien. But the magic for him is not simply the small winged creatures seen in 19th century literature, but rather dragons, trolls, goblins. All the things found in the enchanted world of the most ancient legends. This is the kind of thing he found in those texts. I think it's worth going back to where he spent his years as a student at Exeter College, Oxford. That's where he studied ancient literature. Let's trace the origins then. Maybe we will finally find our hobbit.
John then continues his quest at Exeter College. He is received by Amrit, a member of the Tolkien Society, an association of students formed in Oxford 25 years ago to perpetrate the writer's memory. Without further ado, Amrit leads John to the library Tolkien visited regularly between 1911 and 1915. Joseph, another member of the society, has a surprise in store for him. Thank you very much. So this pleasure. is it. Yes, this is the library. This is where Tolkien spent much of his time. In fact, uh, it's barely changed since he was here. Books get added, but books never get taken away. So really? in many ways, you're seeing it as it was in his time. We still have several of the books he would have used Really? Here. Sometimes hard to tell which ones, but... <laughs> So this is um, Eliot's finished grammar, which um, Tolkien borrowed in his first term at Exeter as an undergraduate. And if we turn to this page here, you can actually see that um, Tolkien has annotated the text Fantastic. in the margin there. That was very naughty of him, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, and it's not the sort of thing we'd encourage nowadays. So neither of you will do that, will you? I'm not confessing anything. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to become very famous afterwards. This was a very inspirational book for Tolkien. It is apparently the, the basis of the language of the elves, which he devised later in Lord of the Rings. So this, in many ways, was a stepping stone uh, out of classics. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, I think, that he borrowed this book in his very first term as an undergraduate when he was studying classics um, before he switched to English literature. So he was obviously interested in the roots of language and creating languages at that early stage. Oh, that's fabulous. That's very moving. It's one of those pivotal points, isn't it, in a person's life? I think they... this book's important for understanding Tolkien, um, Tolkien's mo motivation. Mm -hmm. With the Finnish grammar used by Tolkien more than a hundred years ago, John is immediately plunged into the myths and legends of northern European countries. The collection of Finnish legends known as the Kalevala was a touchstone for the author. In the Kalevala, Tolkien discovered a whole world with its now extinct languages that would mark him forever. Other leads took him deeper into his discovery of Nordic legends. John is fascinated by some 13th century texts that are among the most important tales to come out of the northern countries from Norway to Iceland, the Edda. It seems increasingly clear that we must move to a different geographical area and era and go back even further to find out what must have inspired Tolkien. It appears we have to leave continental Europe, leave the Middle Ages and go back even further to more ancient, more pagan times and maybe board a ship for Iceland. Somewhere in Iceland, Nicholas Medzalira, the narrator of Merlin's magic spells and the legends of King Arthur, has a date with Veronique Favero, a young French researcher living in Reykjavik and fascinated by the work of Tolkien. In a landscape filled with boiling mud and sulfur fumes, Nicholas finds Veronique to share with us the creation of the world as told in the Edda. In the beginning, there was only nothingness, neither land nor sky above, just a vast, gaping abyss. The yawning void was called Ginungagap. Then two worlds formed, one in the north, Niflheim, and another in the south, Muspelheim. The northern world was full of ice, frost, and glacial cold. The southern world was all fire and flames. And when the two came into contact, the ice began to melt, and in doing so, it revealed the colossal body of Ymir, the primeval giant. The heat made him sweat, and from his sweat rose other giants. And then the ice revealed a cow, Audhumla. From the cow's udders flowed four rivers of milk, providing nourishment for all the giants. 
She even licked the ice, and in doing so, she revealed the body of another giant called Buri. According to legend, Buri had a son called Bor, who conjugated with one of the frost ogres. And this union begat the first three gods, Vili, V, and the one we call Odin. These first three Nordic gods, the Aesir, ended up turning against Ymir the giant, killing him and taking him to the edge of the yawning void Genungagap. And with the body of the giant Ymir, they created the Earth. They took his blood and created lakes, rivers and the seas surrounding the Earth. Then they took his bones to make the mountains and from his skull made the canopy of heaven. Then they caught some embers suspended in the air and tossed them into the sky to create the stars, before finally taking the giant Ymir's eyebrows and using them to create a protective barrier all around the world, which they called Midgard, meaning Middle Earth. And then, Véronique, once Middle-earth had been created, the three gods found two tree trunks, one of ash and one of elm. They took the ash and used it to create the first man, whom they called Ask. Next, they took the elm trunk and with it made the first woman, Embla. And thus was Middle-earth populated for the first time. Then the gods were gone. They went to the highest point in the sky to create another kingdom, the kingdom of the Aesir, the realm of the gods, which they called Asgard. They built an extraordinary bridge, a rainbow bridge called Bifrost, to connect Asgard with Midgar. Thus did the Scandinavian gods create the earth of men, Midgard, also called Middle-earth. It's a name that stuck with the young Tolkien, and it proved to be a bottomless well of inspiration for his imagination. Soon he would populate it with avaricious dwarfs, menacing trolls, and many other singular creatures inspired by the myths of Edda. The tale you told us about how the world was created comes from two texts called the Edda, one a poem, one in prose. And in the poetic Edda, among other things, is a text called Voluspa, which is the words of the prophetess recounting how the world and the gods were created. Tolkien worked a lot on these texts. We know that he had a great interest in Germanic languages, especially Old Norse, the language of the ancient Scandinavians. It is in this language, of course, that the Edda are written. And Tolkien began working on the vocabulary and the grammar, etc., by reading the Edda. So, Véronique, what links Scandinavian mythology to the writings of Tolkien? There's Middle-earth. Yes, Middle-earth is Tolkien's world, taken from the Edda. And then there are all the dwarfs' names taken from the Voluspa. There's a whole list of dwarfs' names, and Tolkien picked through them for the names of the dwarfs that subsequently appeared in The Hobbit. His own mythology, in fact. That's right, because Tolkien's creation actually stems from language. He began inventing languages when he was young and really wanted to create a whole set of languages, not just a language at a particular point in its history, but its whole evolution, like Latin through to French and the way it evolved. All the historical weight. Precisely. But in doing that, he realized that for a language to have a history, it had to have people speaking it, so he had to populate his world. And that's what happens in the Silmarillion, which describes the creation of this world. The Silmarillion is an earlier work that predates The Lord of the Rings, and it is in this work that Tolkien is most inspired by the Edda and Nordic mythology. The tale describes the creation of the world, the birth of the elves, how men came into the world, and the way in which these languages evolve. 
In his eyes, this work was much more important than The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. In fact, The Hobbit came much later. When he began writing The Hobbit, it was for his children, and initially he didn't even know himself that it was linked to the same legends. Then, little by little in The Hobbit, dwarves and elves began to appear, and Tolkien realized that his tale was taking place in this broader world he had created, and was part of the same overall story. The Silmarillion plays an important part in The Lord of the Rings because it is the ancient past. The characters all talk about a very distant past, especially the elves and even Aragorn, who sings ancient songs about legends. It means that for all the characters in The Lord of the Rings, there is a past, one that goes back a thousand years, not just a century or so. It gives depth to the text, a sense that it is tied in with ancient history. Tolkien regretted enormously that England did not have its own mythology in the style of Nordic or ancient Greco-Roman mythology. In a way, he wanted to create myths that would explain the origins of England, the origins of the Anglo-Saxon people. And when he wrote all this down, it became what he called the Silmarillion, a great work that was never published during his lifetime. So now we're getting closer. We have a primary source of Tolkien's work. We have dwarves, we have elves. I know that the trolls are not far away. We're in Iceland, the land of trolls. That's right. What would you regard as being closest to the Hobbit in this Nordic world? Aside from Scandinavian mythology itself, as we said, what interested Tolkien the most in the Edda was the language. Another text falls into this category, and that's the writings in Old English known as the Beowulf, the most important work in Old English that dates back to the middle of the 8th century. Tolkien translated it and wrote an essay that revolutionized people's interest in the text. So Beowulf is the story of its eponymous hero, whose help is required by Hrothgar, the king of Denmark, where the story takes place. Hrothgar has a problem. He has had a magnificent banqueting hall built, to which he invites all his men where they drink mead, sing, live it up, etc. This displeases a rather strange creature called Grendel, who turns up at night and attacks the men and kills them. Hrothgar has failed to vanquish the creature, and nobody is brave enough to attack it until Beowulf turns up and rids them of it. And rids them of the creature. This is interesting because it is very reminiscent to a figure found in Tolkien, Gollum. Already the names are not dissimilar. And this poem in Old English tells how Beowulf follows the creature to its underground lair in a very deep cave into which the hero must descend, right at the edge of hell. But there is water there too, and Beowulf has to cross the lake in order to reach his foe. When you think about caves and underground lakes, you naturally think of Gollum and the chapter in which Bilbo meets Gollum in the mountain. He's a, a likeable creature, despite everything. It's true, I describe Grendel as a monster, but he is also rather moving. Beowulf, the hero, rips off his shoulder with his bare hands, and Grendel runs away, terrified. There's something pitiful about him, and it brings us back to Gollum, who is a monstrous character, but also a degenerate hobbit. He's basically Smeagol, and inspires a little sympathy. So we're getting closer to the Hobbit. Smeagol starts out as a Hobbit, but is actually insane. 
With Grendel, we are maybe close to Smeagol, but not close to the Hobbit of the Shire in the fields. Not that Hobbit. Not the Hobbit of the Shire. So it turns out that Iceland, land of Nordic myths, populated with trolls, is not where John will find his hobbit. Having crossed the earth, quizzed Merlin the wizard in Brusseliand, encountered King Arthur in his castle at Tintagel, and the Chevalier Siegfried on the banks of the Rhine, John has dipped into many legends. And in doing so, he has got close to Tolkien, the great narrator, sharing his delight at the myths of old Europe, right up to the one that the author himself sought to write for his own country, England. But has it satisfied John in his quest to discover the origins of The Hobbit? Is his search over? So, John, you've been off on your adventure, your uh, quest to go find The Hobbit, and you've come back to us here in Oxford. Are you going to tell us what you found? Have I found any hobbits? Well, it's been quite a trip, uh, to be honest. We, we've made a great European circuit hmm. of myth and legend and culture. And uh, we've come back to the source of it all. And in the end, we've kind of come full circle because the Hobbit isn't really there. You're going to explain that answer oh. for us. <laughs> well, I think that um, if there is one creation of Tolkien's that you cannot link back to a source, it would have to be Hobbit's. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very true, I think, because you know, if you examine the plot scenario of The Hobbit, you can, if you want to, trace back Smaug to Fafnir, mm -hmm. and you can work out which dwarf is named after which character in the Eda. But there's no direct one-on-one -on -one source for The Hobbit, is there? Okay. And perhaps the reason is because it's sprung directly from sort of his own imagination mm -hmm. um, in an idle moment when he was marking sort of uh, school certificate papers. I mean, I think it's actually in the letters, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, oh, here we are, yes. All I remember about the start of The Hobbit is sitting correcting school certificate papers in the everlasting weariness of that annual task forced on impecunious academics with children. On a blank leaf I scrawled, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. I did not and do not know why. Mm, so what it's saying is that the hobbit sprang from Tolkien's subconscious, really. Mm. Mm. I am, in fact, a hobbit in all but size. I like gardens, trees, and unmechanized farmlands. I smoke a pipe and like good plain food, unrefrigerated, but detest French cooking. I like and even dare to wear in these dull days ornamental waistcoats. I'm fond of mushrooms out of a field, have a very simple sense of humor, which even my appreciative critics find tiresome. I go to bed late and get up late when possible. I do not travel much. So do you think that hobbits resemble Tolkien, or did Tolkien eventually come to resemble hobbits? I think for me, what drew me to the idea of hobbits, and I think reading The Hobbit as a young child, was the idea that these small people can go out and do extraordinary things and have the most wonderful adventures, and it doesn't matter sort of how worldly they are or how much experience they have as to what they can achieve. It's almost as if The Hobbit is our gateway into the deeper mythological world that Tolkien had already created. Uh, because we travel with the Hobbit and see through his eyes. So you're, in a sense, saying that we're seeing this vast, vast world of myth, history, mm. and legend uh, as if we were hobbits, mm. in that mm. sense. Yeah. So you're all hobbits, then? Yes. Oh, <laughs> sitting here with four, with four lovely hobbits. That's quite exciting. So it's, it's a point of view, in that sense, the Hobbit. So it's a, it's, it's a window. Not a very high window, but a, a window you can see out of. And it's also a door, because it's an invitation to go out and have an adventure, isn't it? Isn't that what The Hobbit's all, all about, in a sense? Definitely. Mm. Back yeah. to the idea that the ordinary person of exception is a hobbit. Mm -hmm. mm. Which I think is quite an extraordinary concept, because everything that defines hobbits as hobbits makes them conservative, stay-at-home, uninterested in the wide world, mm. but the very essence of hobbits is that they're capable of going out mm. and doing grand things if they get caught up in a story. Mm. I have the impression we've come back to the right place. Thank you.
you. Take care. We'll see you. So, did you find the celebrated Hobbit? We found it, but in the end, we found a great deal more than we thought we'd find at the outset. What is the Hobbit like? Well, it's actually like you and me. Meaning we are all Hobbits? Ordinary men in the middle of an extraordinary story. So, amid these dragons, trolls and goblins, the Hobbit is just a regular citizen. Great mythology and great legends have no place for ordinary people. The best way into this wonderful world is to find yourself a place there. And that's what Tolkien gives us. The Hobbit, then, must be sought in Tolkien's head. So is the search over? It's almost the end. I have just one more small thing to do.